It was brought to the board on the July 12th board meeting. The board voted to hear the complaint, and that was booked for tonight. From a process standpoint, we are following past practice, and I'll just quickly review the process. Uh, we'll hear from the superintendent on the decision. We'll hear a quick opening for me, I think, for Stephanie. And then we'll hear from both sides. Both sides will give me the opportunity to uh, review their information, witnesses, whatever they want to do. Be 20 minutes aside, with 10 minutes to cross examine. Once I hand it off to the parties, it's your meeting to run and call your witnesses, call your people, do whatever. Uh, and then uh, we'll uh, do closing statements, two minutes at the end, at the end uh, for deliberation. Again, it's pretty much just following class practice how we've dealt with uh, these items in the past. Chris, can I ask a question? Um, toward the end, when they're doing the closing statements or after they're doing the closing statements, will there be an opportunity? I don't think it's working. Oh, this one. Okay. Will there be an opportunity for us just to ask a few follow up questions to the lawyers? Appreciate your question, sir. This one at the end, we'll have an opportunity to ask some follow up questions to the lawyers, kind of narrow down just what the issue is and what's not. I think we'll need to discuss that as a board before we ask the question. I I mean, there could be an opportunity to present to us, and if we have clarifying questions, we can still ask clarifying questions. Yeah. All right, any questions on the process? With that, first, we'll hear superintendent's decision, Steve. Good evening for those of uh, you in attendance. Uh, for the benefit of those in attendance, my name is Steve Murray, and I serve as superintendent of schools for the United City Community School District. I served in the school uh, since July of 2010. Uh, this evening is a challenging one for the district, community, and staff members involved in this issue. The district has high expectations for students and staff. When those expectations are not met, action is required. Prior to the action in question this evening, it was known for some time that the conduct of Ms. Ben Housen interfered with and impaired the effective delivery of services to students and families. Ms. Ben Housen's role required her to be a facilitator, but over time she became an impediment to the overall delivery of services because she couldn't or wouldn't work collaboratively within the district. Efforts to change Ms. Van Housen's negative behavior were not successful. In fact, Ms. Van Housen's behavior became more problematic following these efforts. The decision to suspend Ms. Van Housen would pay not to continue her employment with the district with the right decisions for all students and should be upheld by the board. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity tonight. Uh, my name is Nate Willems and I represent Stephanie Van Husen. Stephanie has been employed for 80 years with the Iowa City School District as the Homeless Liaison and as a student family advocate. The Homeless Liaison exists pursuant to federal and state law. Pursuant to the law, it is her job to ensure that homeless children receive access to the same educational opportunities as other children and to ensure homeless children receive transportation as needed. School districts and school administrators face any number of pressures. They have pressures to increase test scores, reduce disciplinary problems, and have tight budgets. It is Stephanie's job to be the lead advocate for a population of students who may not be high academic performers and may bring challenging, some challenging behavioral issues to school. Inherent within this context is the potential in certain situations uh, that an, an administrator and the homeless liaison may be working at cross purposes. Their interests and their job duties collide. These collisions create friction. In fact, the more dogged and, de and determined a homeless liaison like Stephanie is to make sure homeless kids get in school and get to stay there, the more likely it becomes that her work will be resented by one or more particular administrators. That's why we're here. Stephanie's dogged determination on behalf of homeless kids. When a decision appears to take away an opportunity for a homeless student, it's been her job to second guess and at times seek to overturn an administrator's decision. Add to that the fact that Stephanie is lower paid than administrators and an at-will employee without a contract or a union to support her, and maybe it shouldn't surprise us that administration is able to pick her as a scapegoat she's easier to fire. In the flurry of activity that led to the superintendent firing Stephanie, the school has offered any number of justifications. As we provided in the letter uh, and, and the, the, the emails and such, these justifications are contrary to school board policy, federal and state law, 
inconsistent with practice, and simply reflect a lack of investigation by the district. We thank you for your time tonight and simply ask that you put back to work a dedicated public servant who tirelessly advocates for the most vulnerable children in this community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just before you start, just from a audience standpoint, this is a meeting of the school board and the public, and we need to maintain order throughout. And the last thing I want you to do is slow these guys down and talk about what they want to talk about. So we can't have interruptions, so I'll just say that once. And uh, we need to proceed in an orderly basis. So. With that, Nate, take it away, your fine hands. Thank you. Uh, I would just like to uh, ask Stephanie some questions of the direct examination. Uh, Stephanie, I'm going to ask you a number of questions tonight, mostly centered on the events from March 25 and early April. Uh, but, but there is one incident from prior to that that I'm going to ask you some questions about uh, from the fall of 2014. Uh, so I'm going to show you some emails that have been provided to board members uh, related to a particular homeless youth situation. Do you recall this particular situation from the fall of 2014? Yes, I do. What, without identifying the particular student, could you just tell us what was happening in this particular situation? This was a youth, the, a homeless unaccompanied youth that had been denied enrollment in school. Um, the person in, that he was, he was staying with um, asked the school, the student family advocate, how, how to get him enrolled. Um, they, contacted me, I helped the, the adult that was helping this, this young man um, try to get enrolled. I talked to the administration about it. Um, they wanted to charge him 6000 and some dollars tuition um, because he answered the question in a way that made it look like he was wanting to go to school. Um, we appealed the, the to the decision to the associate superintendent. She didn't hear the, she wouldn't come up with a, a response to the appeal. The person that then, with my assistance, appealed it to the um, State Department of Education, and the associate superintendent was ordered to enroll the student immediately or contact the, the state's attorneys. And Stephanie, I've been given today uh, by the board's attorney uh, a letter from Ann Feldman that, that's my understanding relates to this, this issue. And I'm just going to read an excerpt from this letter from Ms. Feldman. Uh, I told her, meaning you, uh, you were required to follow a chain of command in that if you felt her decision, Anne's decision was improper, uh, she was to appeal to my supervisor or the other assistant superintendent. Then if she felt his or her decision was improper, she could contact an outside agency or the Iowa Department of Education with her concerns. Within a week of being heard this very specific instruction, she ignored it and was involved in contacting an outside agency to lobby for a decision other than the one I made. Upon confronting her with this, she essentially told me she believed she didn't need to adhere to any district limitations on her actions as they pertain to students she determined were homeless. And then I'm going to just give that excerpt back to you and ask, what's your reaction? Well, this isn't exactly how it happened, and I wasn't exactly told to follow the chain of command. I was told to never contact the Department of Education about any homeless um, or homeless on the company with any homeless issue. I was forbidden from contacting them. Um, what she did tell me was that um, that that. 
she was going to fire me if I ever contacted the Department of Education. So, Ann, or Stephanie, I'm going to want to move forward to the events in March and April. Uh, my understanding is it starts on March 25 that there was a, a series of events started the series of events started with community groups seeking meeting room space at Grantwood Elementary. Uh, and I'm going to refer to uh, to direct you to some of this uh, disciplinary document dated April 13, 2016 that you received from Jim Peterson of Human Resources. The disciplinary document says that uh, your derogatory comments to community members led to negative communications with Tracy Heinshu with the city of Iowa City. Uh, can, can you tell me what happened with the city of Iowa City? There was a group of, of community agencies that wanted to um, come up with a plan to deal with the, the closing of the Rose Oaks apartments. There were 400 um, units there, and it was in the Grantwood attendance area. At, the behest, at their behest, I requested um, to reserve the community room at Grantwood Elementary School. I had a conversation with the principal, and um, my impression after that conversation was that there was not a community, that the district didn't view there being a community room at Grantwood School any longer. Um, I was a little confused and unsure, so I contacted the city of Iowa City. Later on, I was provided a copy of the 28 E agreement between the city and the school district that governs that the use of that space. Stephanie, I'm going to show you an excerpt from that 28 E agreement, uh, looking at, uh, at paragraph C. Could you tell us what it says? It says the Family Resource Center shall be available to the community after school hours subject to scheduling and approval by the ICCSD. Preference will be given to residents living in the wood in between elementary attendance areas or organizations serving households that reside in the wood in 20 elementary attendance areas. Was that community room made available? No, it was not. But is it, isn't it possible that that particular room uh, was, was too small to accommodate the fact that we well, there was, there was uh, the group wanted to have a meeting before the meeting, a sort of pre-meeting, and I had explained that to the principal, um, and it, this would have easily accommodated that small group. Stephanie, so, moving on in, in the disciplinary notice, uh, you've been accused of challenging the decisions of your supervisors. Have you done that? Yes, at, at times it, I may have challenged the decisions of my supervisors. That's my job. Um, I, in the 81 pages that the administration has provided to the board, I stand by my decisions that I made. Now, on the night of March 30th, it's my understanding that this community meeting did take place at Grant Wood. Uh, but then in the disciplinary notice, you are accused of giving unauthorized tours of special education rooms and sharing your negative views of the district's special education program. Did you give anybody a tour? I did give a tour that evening. I, I, how, how did that come to happen? Well, I, after the meeting was over, I was introduced to a woman by the name of Kat Litchfield. She's a, 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 she was a visitor to the school, first time at the school and a community member um, and parent in the district. She said that she had been late to the meeting because she had been looking around for the community room where she thought it was to be held and couldn't find that. Um, as we were talking, we walked down the hall. It's maybe 100 feet or more. It's past the gymnasium way right to the end of the building. And I showed her where the community was and, and how um, how it's outfitted with, with sink and, and tables for adult meetings and that kind of thing. As we were talking, um, she told me a little bit about her research interests at the university, because she teaches there also, 
And um, she said that she's interested in special education behavior disorders, students in particular. Um, she's in, in, in interested in the school and prison pipeline. Um, I, I took her on a tour through the building, showed preschool rooms, talked about programs that we have at the district. Um, I think we had um, Taekwondo going on that night in the gym, and we have roller derby another night, and we have English language classes. I told her, um, I showed her the rooms, the special education rooms, because we have two of them there for be behavior disorder children. Have you given tours in Brandon before? Many, many tours, yes. To whom? I give tours um, mostly anymore to volunteers. I work with a vast number of volunteer, community volunteers. I give, I give tours to agency representatives. I give tours to parents. I give tours to students. I give tours to students from other schools. Had, had you given tours of other school buildings before? Yes, I had. I've given tours when I was um, stationed at Mark Twain School. I gave a lot of tours of the building there. Um, out at ESC, where I have a cubicle, I also gave tours out here of ESC. In all that, in all of your time in the district, had you ever been required to seek permission in order to give somebody a tour? No. Was giving tours part of your job? Yes, it was. Um, as a student family advocate and homeless liaison, I was trained in the Karen Knapp Family and Community Engagement Model. And part of that model is um, making the school welcoming. And part of making a school welcoming is to give a tour and to talk about the school and help people take ownership, whether the people be parents or community members, of the school because they indeed are owners of the school. And I understand that Ms. Lishfield saw these boxes in the, in the B in the behavior disorder rooms. Could you tell us what you recall about that interaction? She seemed to be distressed and a little bit surprised. Um, she took photos of the boxes and um, she asked questions about the boxes and, and she also um, asked questions about the behavior disorder program in the schools. And how, how did you respond? I, I answered the questions as best I could um, about district policy governing the use of them and, um, and the district policies with the behavior, behavior disorder program. Um, but I couldn't answer a lot of the questions and I, I told her that when I couldn't, didn't know the answers to the questions. Did you, did you criticize administrators or teachers? Well, I thought about that question quite a bit because um, the only thing that could be considered a criticism is I told her that, that these boxes do reduce suspensions, out of school suspensions for children. And, and in turn, that increases the student attendance at, Grant, at school, Grantwood and other schools that will increase attendance. But that doesn't mean that behavior is improved. Did, did Ms. Lichfield tell you she was going to send out an email? No. Did you ask that she, uh, she advocate publicly for anything? No. Now, this disciplinary letter also says your inability to foster work relationships and sever existing relationships with the district personnel is well documented. How do you understand that, Chris? Well, as I told you before, um, sometimes the decisions that I make and in my job um, might not be appreciated by administration. Um, I, I stand by what I, I, I did in my actions. Um, the disciplinary letter also says that you defy the directive to follow the chain of command and it's critical of you for contacting school board members uh, do, you, do you recall when this take place? April 5th. Well, what happened on April 5th? On April 5th, my um, supervisor and administrator with the district, um, Joan Vandenberg, called me into her office for, um, for our, our supervisory meeting. And um, she, we talked about many things, but she told me that, um, that administration had um, had, had decided that, that they didn't trust me anymore. Um, she said that, um, 
that I wasn't a team, I wasn't viewed as being a team player. And um, she she said that that they um, trying to think of what the word was. You understood this was this in isolation or was this related to anything else? No, this is all related to um, actions. She said it was because of the um, the Cat Litchfield email and Mary um, Masher getting involved, and she said that it was because of the special education rooms um, and the tour in the special education rooms that the district um, just couldn't stand behind me anymore. So, I mean, getting back to contacting the board members, did you contact board members? Well, on April 5th, after that meeting with Joe, I, I was in, someone came and talked to me from the from, from superintendent's office and, and told me that the, a group of children that I have been, been known to work um, passionately with for the last two and a half years were being canceled from the board's next agenda. And um, there were about 90 kids and their parents and, and that. And these were homeless kids, immigrant kids, minority kids, and um, all low-income children. And it, it kind of felt a little bit like it might be retaliation. So I, I, I thought about it, and I finished my work day, and I went home and I thought some more. And I, I did write email to the board, and I asked them, I asked them first, um, well, I, I told them that this felt like retaliation, and I was hoping that it was not retaliation because it was affecting the children of the district. Um, I, I asked them to put themselves in the shoes of the children that were, were being uninvited. And then I asked them many times in that email to the board, I asked them, what should I tell these children and their parents? and the coaches and um, the community that have been supporting these kids, the clubs, I, I, what should I tell them? And I, I asked that five or six times in the email. Well, Stephanie, why did you just express these concerns to your supervisors? Well, just a f less than a couple, two hours before, I'd been told that the, the administration and, and did, no longer trusted me, and that they weren't they work, that they wouldn't be willing to work with me, and, and basically, um, I was not a team player. Did you believe it was proper to contact board members? I certainly did. There is a board policy that says any employee can contact the school board, one member or all of the members, at any time about any reason. Now, the disciplinary notice also states that while you were suspended from work, you contacted the state representative and the ISCA. Did you do those things? Yes, I did. Why? I, I contacted them because I felt like I was being treated unfairly. I felt like um, the district was doing some things that were incorrect. And um, I wanted some ideas of what I could do, and I wanted to raise their awareness to what the district was doing. Thanks, Nancy. Can we ask some questions of council? Uh, no. The district now has the opportunity to. Uh, Are they clarifying questions? Yes, clarifying questions. Well, the district has the first opportunity to Okay, yeah, just so long as we get an opportunity to We'll, we'll discuss that, Phil. All, right. uh, all right, I'll hand it off to the district for 10 minutes of cross-examination if you desire. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lynch. <clears throat> Ms. Van Housen, the meeting at Grant Wood did take place to the Uh, the meeting at Grantwood, the pre-meeting or the meeting? The meeting of the concerned citizens, residents of uh, Rose Oaks. Yes, it did. You indicated that you felt it was your job to challenge administrators. Is it also part of your job to lead the student family advocates? 
I'm is sorry, it, what? Is it part of your job to provide guidance to and direction to the student family advocates in the district? It's part of my job to provide, to provide guide, guidance about homeless issues to the students and family advocates. In relation to the item taken off the board agenda, were you advised that the request had come from the board to streamline the agenda for that evening? What I was um, told was that the board president had taken off the Everybody Plays Soccer group from the board agenda so that he could highlight the, the Hoover groundbreaking. And this didn't sound at all like the board that I knew. Um, I had been on the equity committee for quite a while, and this board has been very interested in hearing from students, in hearing about activities of, of minority groups in our district. Do you know other agenda items? And this didn't, items? Sound, excuse me, this didn't sound at all like them. Do you know other items were taken off the agenda for that meeting? I'm, I'm not in charge of the agenda. I only know what I was told. And then I was told that they wouldn't be rescheduled. I have another question. Thanks, gentlemen. All right, with that, what is it? That's my question. Does it okay? Yeah, I may ask it. You can ask it to us. You can ask it to them. We'll decide if they're okay. Well, I wanted to go back to the, uh, they had a few. I wanted to go back to the 2014 email from uh, Ann Feldman to Stephanie. And she stated she wasn't to contact the Department of Ed. I wondered if she cited any board policy in her state code preventing her to do so. Go ahead, Ann. I mean, I'm not in a position to offer to answer that question. I'm stepping in to answer that question. You're asking me? I was, I was asking you on the, on, on the 2014 when you received the answer to the email. Uh, you were instructed not to contact the State Department of I, I was curious if they cited any board policy or any state code to support that. Absolutely not. Uh, also, um, are you aware of any, and let's do use our judgment, I mean like a, a uh, I, just, I just want to be clear what you're asking. Let's clarify what we're asking the question, so what is the question? Okay, the question is, is there, are there any parts of our school buildings other than, let's say, locker rooms, uh, when students are in them, which is off, off limits to the public, the taxpayers, and the stakeholders in our district. Are you aware of any, build, any parts of the building that are off in the You're asking us to step in? I'm asking us to step in here. Okay, go ahead. I believe that the locked room where the server is located in this building is off limits to anyone. And as far as I know, that is the only place that I've ever been told is off limits to everyone. Also, uh, I asked uh, the district if we could see your only evaluation done by the district. Is, it would be possible for us to view that evaluation. I would like for you to view that evaluation as well as the survey of administrators and FSA, SFAs um, uh, about my job, about how they thought I was doing my homeless liaison part of the job. Remember, I wore two hats all the time. Well, I, I'd, I'd like that provided to the board with you. Yeah, well, again, well, it's a personal record. We could have chosen to provide that to us as well, but we have to do that in closed session, right? No. What's your point? I can provide it. If has an objection, it can be provided to us. Do you have a copy provided? Yes, I have a copy right now. I can give to you. We opted to have this as an open session, certainly. 
just needs to be clarified, Nate, right? So, yeah. 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 I have my end of year reports if you want to see those also. Anything I can serve? I'll just provide copies to the board secretary and you can do that. But it's handy. I was going to mention the same thing, so thank you, Nate. All right, so I'll just provide that to Nate and give it to Ken Murray. What? Nate and give it to Ken and we can get some copies made. Okay. All right, with that, you can hand it off to the district. 20 minutes. With that, I, with that, I'd like to ask some questions of John Vandenberg, who is seated at the table uh, between Mr. Peters and Mr. Murley. Uh, so let me just ask you to get the mic a little closer. <laughs> is it working? <laughs> John, is there anything you'd like to add to your bio about your experience with the district? Um, sure. I've been here uh, since 1994. I was the first campus coordinator. Um, just retired. Um, Barbara we hired me because of my community experience, and I worked at neighborhood centers 10 years prior to that. So I had a lot of connections with the community. So it was kind of um, that partnering that she was interested in me helping with. Are you familiar with laws dealing with homeless students and services? Um, absolutely. Um, I've been here so long that um, my work. Dates and McKinney Bento, it was just McKinney. Um, that was a um, uh, grant that we had when I started in 1994. And at that time, it was funny, a counselor at Longfellow, so I advocated that we use that for transportation. And so, predating the liaison position, I became a liaison in 1996, um, facilitating the transportation and being a liaison between shelters in, in the school district. Have you been in Ms. Benton Housing Supervisor? Um, yes, I have um, since 2010. Do you have issues with how she does her job? Um, well, I, I have a lot to say on that. Um, and I have some prepared comments on this because I feel like it's very important. Um, and I want to be efficient with her time. Um, never in my wildest dreams did I think that I would be before you here tonight talking about Stephanie's employment. 
This is not ever where I wanted to go. This is never where any of our student family advocates wanted us to end up. This has been very painful for all of us involved. Um, but this is an on district. We're here because Stephanie has made some very poor choices. Um, my first concern has been Stephanie's ability to lead others in kind of some basic role confusion. Um, our district serves 14,000 students, and about 500 of those are identified as homeless each year. It has never been the job of the homeless liaison to provide case management to that many students. We have student family advocates who are building liaisons in each school to do the case management with student families. The program also works closely with agency partners, the transportation department, the building secretaries, building administrators, food service, Title I, um, and equity. So the, the homeless liaison is the architect to make sure that our district and our community partners are delivering the service that we need to to fulfill our making mental rights of the homeless students and that we're providing all the support services that we can. So there were, over the years, there has been a fair amount of confusion about that. Secondly, um, her communication style had become an impediment to doing her job. She referenced her job description in 2012, and you'll notice that in an area for growth, way back in 2012, um, one of her growth areas was to increase self-awareness of how your approach is being perceived by others, particularly when dealing with issues that feel strongly about. So this was, we were beginning to see signs of that even back then, but I, I liked Stephanie, I saw many great things in her, so I wanted to continue to work with her to improve those things. So I worked, we set goals, it was to build the capacity of our other um, case managers to serve the homeless families and to focus on, on the high school and also process the transportation requests and to reduce lunch forms within 24 hours. So um, I would say it was probably in 2013-14 when I noticed that the collaboration had become much more difficult. Stephanie had several conflicts with her colleagues and with administration. I moved her to be part-time at the ESC and in addition to her office at Grantwood. And we started meeting more regularly. Um, she also referenced the year-end wrap-up in the survey that we did in, at the end of 2014. And when we reviewed that survey, um, another goal area, again, was clear boundaries and role clarification for families, especially those families where she's going deep. Um, also to roll out more and new procedures so people are closer clear on their roles and to continue to build the capacity of other staff. So those, again, I gave her that feedback. So in January 2015, we started having regular check-in meetings and um, we discussed, if not every week, close to every week, of how she was communicating and leading. Um, repeatedly, I said, she has tremendous knowledge of making mental and homeless issues that we're seeing, but that doesn't benefit the students and families if she cannot effectively communicate those with others. If staff lack the knowledge about homeless issues, it was her job to teach them in a respectful and professional manner. In, in the spring of 2015, um, Stephanie had received, or raised concerns that she didn't have enough time staff. So it seemed like a legitimate concern because there are lots of things to address with these homeless families. So I worked with Green Frank, who provides training for all of our staff to structure more time. And so my strategy was, with more required training and the expectations being clear, it would be um, a strong working relationship between student and family advocates and, and the relationships with Stephanie would improve. So for 2015-16, we scheduled required training sessions for the student and family advocates, and the working relationships did not improve. Um, in fact, I believe they further deteriorated. Staff voiced complaints to Crane Frank and to me that Stephanie was rude and condescending. There were not clear written procedures, and Stephanie gave inconsistent messages for how to address home situations. When I processed this with her, I witnessed behavior that I hadn't previously seen. She accused the student family advocates of being mean girls, of being jealous of her, they just wanted her job. Staff just didn't want to work with homeless families. Stephanie consistently blamed others when an interaction didn't go well. She did not take responsibility for treating someone disrespectfully. In December, a formal complaint was filed with Kingsley because Stephanie accused 20 staff of not wanting to serve a homeless preschool student. And about that same time, the student and family advocates wrote a letter regarding concerns with the homeless program. This letter is in your packet, um, and it, it basically has three key, 
requests. One is more guidelines in writing, alternatives for when the liaison is not available so they can receive immediate responses to time-sensitive issues, and respectful communication. Kingsley and I met with Stephanie on December 8th and we told her she needed to have respectful communication with her colleagues and also asked that she have clear written policies by January 31st. We felt it was important that procedures be written down and easily accessible to clear up what seemed to be inconsistent implementation. Stephanie provided training on homeless transportation on February 12th and on February 18th. More responsibility was given to the student and family advocates to arrange transportation, which allowed them greater autonomy. <coughs> A couple of weeks later, after the March 9th Equity Committee meeting, Stephanie was briefing with me about how the meeting had gone. I commented the Equity Committee had to feel positive that we have a student and family advocate in every building. And Stephanie's response was the student family advocates weren't really advocates. They were only there to manipulate families into getting, getting mental health services. And that's when I knew that we were absolutely going to need a change in her role. It was painfully apparent to me that Stephanie had held a very dim view of most of the student family advocates and questioned their intentions. At this time, Susie Polk, my immediate supervisor, told me that she was going to propose a change in her job description. I shared with her that things weren't going so well with Stephanie as a homeless liaison, and we briefly discussed how we could restructure our department to move Stephanie out of a leadership position and reassign her to a different job in the district. I would give Stephanie a performance review in the spring and we'd take it from there. So a major responsibility of the homeless liaison is absolutely to ensure the district is compliant with McKinney Vento, which Stephanie took very seriously as she should. There were several instances where Stephanie advocated for a student on issues on timely enrollment or school of origin that she was right on and I was so glad that she was there because she was a fabulous advocate on those. But there were also instances that she used the McKinney Vento um, to intimidate others. In the name of compliance with McKinney Vento, she overturned plans that student family advocates had made with families. This gave families mixed messages and made the families already chaotic situations more stressful. As an example, we had a homeless elementary student who was essentially kidnapped by an estranged parent. The student briefly enrolled in another school in another community. Thankfully, the parent was able to get the child back to Iowa City. But Stephanie said this homeless child could not return to the school where he had previously attended since it was in the school of origin. I backed the student family as advocate plan to have that student return um, and, and not allow the student to return, basically allowed him to return to school even though he didn't have school of origin rights. So you can do more for homeless students than that's required, but you cannot do less. And you can even do this floor, not the ceiling. I want to emphasize how Stephanie led our group on their practice with homeless families. So it goes beyond having friendly working relationships. It was damaging to students. So I share all this with you as I feel it's important to provide some context for what happened prior to the community media at Brownwood. Because the relationships with her colleagues and administrators was already so damaged, there was no trust. John, were you consulted in early April about her suspension? Um, I was. Um, and it, basically, it was her actions following her paid administrative leave, which was the deal breaker for me to continue her employment in the Iowa City Community School District. What was the deal breaker? Um, she veered outside the parameters of her position. And as an example, we were providing transportation to a student who formerly lived at Rose Oak so he could finish up here at the same school. The student clearly was in a traumatic situation, um, but worried that Ms. Stephanie was going to lose her job. So with everything that that student has going on, do they really need to have Ms. Stephanie's job on the list of things that they have to worry about? It was probably really scary to this family that Stephanie wasn't there, but we have a very experienced and capable student and family advocate at that school. Stephanie knows that, and she knows that. And if she were truly concerned about the well-being of that family, she would have reassured them that the student and family advocate has this and to make sure that they would get the support that they needed. And she would love her personal issues out of it. Maybe. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I need to save a little time for Jim. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you still support the decisions to suspend her and not to continue her employment? I, I do. Do you think that's in the best interest of the students in the community? Um, I do. Um, so much of our work with homeless families is out of our control. There's a lack of affordable housing, there's terrible paying jobs, there's lack of transportation. But there are things that we can control. 
and we don't need more chaos within our program. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Lynch, I don't know if you want to let Mr. Willis cross-examine uh, Ms. Van Hurt now or reserve his time until after Ms. Willis' hand up. Jim Peterson, Jim, would you uh, explain a little more of your position in the district both now and in the last few months and historically? Uh, yes, my name is Jim Peterson. I uh, was the Director of Human Resources for 12 years starting in 2002 and then retiring and the person who replaced me left the district and uh, I was asked to come back for one semester. Um, so, uh, I spent about uh, 18 years in human resources in Newton and the rest of it here in Iowa City. Before that, I was a teacher, and um, that's my background. Are you acquainted with Ms. Van Housen? Uh, my first um, work with Stephanie was when we were on the equity committee, when my child was the head of that at that time, and, uh, but after that, really not. Had staff discussed concerns about Ms. Van Housen with you prior to 2016? Not so much prior as during the investigation when the whole uh, Grantwood situation erupted. And I just want to say that, as she even admits, that she was not denied the community room uh, for that meeting. She, uh, the principal of the building, denied the use of that room because it was not large enough. And she filled out the proper paperwork and it was denied based on that. The other part, especially the tour, I found very problematic just because of the nature of the BD room, um, the confidentiality of the BD room. Um, and so if you roll back the train wreck, if she doesn't give the, if she doesn't give the tour of the BD room, then we don't have the pictures going viral and did create quite a, a uh, firestorm for the district and it took away a lot of uh, necessary time for those things by several administrators. The 13th memo uh, suspending her with pay mentions contacting board members, contacting ISCA, and contacting her measure. Were those the reasons for the extended suspension or just symptoms of a deeper problem? Yeah, in hindsight, I wish I would not have said those names, but uh, actually, she has every right to contact those folks. And, and in essence, um, where my investigation failed, her initial contact wasn't with Mary Masher, it was a result of the pictures going viral. Uh, I, I felt the contact with ISEA was kind of unusual as opposed to the PERC board, uh, because ISEA only represents teachers who do not represent. So, uh, when, when I started getting those responses back from Coy Marquardt, who was, uh, was the uh, president of, or head of the ISEA, um, that kind of threw us for a loop there. But it was a, the main concern that I had was her failure to follow the chain of command. And that in a healthy organization, we don't all agree, but we have the ability to work out solutions together, we have the ability to problem solve together, but in a healthy organization, I think that thinking makes it stronger. But if we never come to some win-win situation for kids, then it's detrimental, detrimental to the organization. So the fair to say the reason that is when housing is suspended wasn't the specific acts as part of the whole pattern behavior. Exactly right, especially after we started digging into those, the history of that, since I was gone, you know, I, I had gone for two and a half years, so I really wasn't up to speed of what had taken place since then. And so when I uh, followed up on those situations, and you notice that we went from April 13th to uh, June 14th and had not made a decision. We didn't purposely uh, have that length of time. That was just for us to conduct an investigation. We thought of every possible avenue that she might be able to fit into the system. Uh, uh, these things are not easy. If we, if we enjoy doing those things, we, we 
these types of situations we are in the wrong business. But um, definitely, um, I would stand by that letter of reprimand, and I would make the same decision today. I know even though I had the collaboration of many people in this central office, um, you know, I guess it was my decision to do the letter. But I, did, I didn't do this in isolation. I received input from Susan Colton, from Joan, from Mr. Uh, Early, from uh, lots of different folks. I mean, this, to me, was the only solution that we felt was best for kids. Because if you can't collaborate in a district like ours, it's ultimately going to hurt the delivery of our kids. Jim, the letters from the SFA, is this to the family advocates influence that decision? And letters from the other building principals and other administrators? Sure, they all were a piece of, of support for that decision. Did any, anybody on staff come out in support of Ms. Van Housen and say uh, that she should be treated unfairly and she shouldn't be terminated? You know, I think that's, that's telling for the board that we did not have one of our 2,000 employees or especially one of the people she works closely with come to us and say this is wrong. I think there's one other uh, appendix six hearing where we did have people come that work with that individual do you still believe it's a correct decision to suspend Ms. Van Housen and not to continue her employment? Yes. You think that's in the best interest of the students and the community? Yes. All right, any other questions? Thank you. All right, 10 minutes. <clears throat> Thank you. Ms. Stanford, I just want to ask you a number of questions. Uh, first, mention the first. Are you aware that the district provided to board members 81 pages kind of summarizing the grounds for the discipline or termination? I am. And it, the first thing you talked about was role confusion. I think you said that over the years there, there's been confusion. And my question is, where in, in the 81 pages is that concern about role confusion reflected? Well, I haven't memorized the 81 pages, but um, I certainly have given that feedback to seven of the years. And then you made, you said, talked about uh, Stephanie having negative communications with peers or, or other staff in 2012, 2013, 2014. That's not in the 81 pages either, is it? Uh, I believe that was the performance review in the, in the, in the board package. If, um, I guess what I'm saying is the comments in the performance review included communication issues, and I thought that was part of the 81 pages. Um, there are a couple other, you made a couple of comments that Stephanie more recently has made negative comments about SFAs, that they were mean girls, this, that, or the other thing. And, and my question is, where is that reflected in the 81 pages? It's, it's in the timeline that, that we gave <coughs> the reprimand. It's, um, it was with his, her suspension letter. Okay. And the plans to reassign her that were apparently were in the works. Where is that reflected in the pages? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, Ms. Stanford, you, you mentioned that uh, that Stephanie has tremendous knowledge of the McKinney event, though. And so, isn't it accurate that she's kind of the help, kind of was held out by the district to be the go-to person? for SFAs on the Kenny Vento questions. Yes. So she may not have been you know, manager subordinate with the SFAs, but she was held out to be the district's knowledgeable person for those but questions. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, I'm
you characterized Stephanie's statements as accusing staff, making an accusation that staff did not want a homeless student at 20. Is that That's right. Preschool And but isn't it true that what, what Stephanie left on a, on a voice message, that the quote was something like, I'm starting to get the feeling that staff don't want uh, the, the student to train. Is it looking at the quote? Probably something similar to that, yeah. But you understood saying, I'm starting to get the feeling that whatever as an accusation. Is that right? Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, an issue about, um, and I'm trying to summarize, but about a, a homeless child being essentially kidnapped. Uh, is that reflected in the 81 pages? It is not. And then you mentioned that uh, her actions following being placed on paid leave with a deal breaker for you. Is that right? Is, is that yeah, That's correct. Uh, and, I, and then you said something that she brought her her personal something into uh, the situation. And I guess my question is, where is that reflected in these 81 pages? It's not. I have no more questions for John, just a, a handful of questions for John. Uh, Jim, you talked about the, 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 from your perspective, the, the district can't let uh, people in the, the BD room at Grant Wood. Is that a fair characterization of what you said? I'm saying that that is much different than giving them a tour of a building and or a math room and or because there's confidential information in there. Especially when the teacher does not is not aware of it. They may have stuff that they should have locked up, or for whatever reason, they may not. And it might be boards, academic boards on walls. It could be several things. But, but isn't it true that those specific rooms are used for child care when there are ESL classes being taught adults at, at night at that, at that elementary building? That I, I do not know. I could not answer that. I mean, you're aware that there are ESL classes taught in that building? Correct. Okay. So you're aware that there would be volunteers coming in uh, for, for those types of uh, classes, is that right? I, I, that I don't know. Okay. Would, would it surprise you to learn that, that, that uh, volunteers and parents taking these classes would have been uh, allowed into that room? Nothing would really surprise me very much. And I don't really know. I, I cannot speak to that. I don't know. I think that's a clarifying Sure. Um, yeah. Just, I'm wondering if I'll approach you. Yeah? Great. Thank you. I'm just wondering if we have three copies of, um, of that letter from the SFAs. And each one is a little bit different than the other. And one of them is dated in December, and two of them are dated in April. And I'm just wondering if you, if you could tell us anything about sort of how that, and why that letter is there in the record three times, and why each one's a little different. I can only I can only speak to the two. Uh, one was written on for behalf of the board. The other was written on behalf of uh, Mr. Murray and myself. Do, do you know who wrote it? The uh, student family advocates. So, I mean, we don't know why it changed at all between the, because there are, there are little changes between there, the There are several changes because one is a public document and one is to the superintendent and to the human resources. So, uh, I, I can't speak for them, but I can only say that they would feel a little more free to share their uh, true feelings. I think the point they wanted to get across the board is there's several people doing this work, and Stephanie is not working in isolation. She has a lot of people doing the same type of work. Maybe not, you know, maybe not in the exact area, but uh, and I think that's the point they were getting, getting across. <coughs> Any 
and that's why I contacted the city because I was unsure of that. I thought that the community revenue agreement went to the year 2021. In actuality, it goes to 2036. I have one more question that has to do with the uh, performance review that, that you pulled out of the binder and passed every year to the, to the to board. Mm -hmm. You have read it, you will. Um, since this is an, uh, I believe I, if I heard you correctly, Nate, that, the, um, that choosing to have this discussion in an open meeting, uh, any reference we would be willing to have open would be her, her entire personnel record be available? Or is that something that... Yeah, I'm just curious if we're going to get one performance review. Would we have an opportunity to review the entire performance review? There is only one performance review. Right. Okay. In all those years. There's no other feedback. There is no other feedback. There's a survey that was given. This um, serves the homeless liaison for the district, and this is with... Um, this is with SFAs and with administrators. And um, every year there was a survey given, but I have one review in my personnel file in all those years. Is there anything else? As far mm -hmm. as I'm concerned, as far as I'm concerned, there are um, personnel files that the district staff you know, here to make available to board members and board members. And I'm fine with that too. I just ask that you not know, use my, you know, identifying information, like my social security number. I've <laughs> heard the statement made that, um, you know, that, that um, there's board policy to approach the board, and there, there is board policy to approach the board. Um, certainly, uh, always open to, to hearing uh, concerns. Um, there's also a um, protocol and procedure to approach the board as well. And then after going through all our board policies and having carefully reviewed board policies over the last three years, I just want to be clear that it's not specifically say you jump right to the board. There's something I think you talk about. I okay. 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 One quick question concerning uh, performance reviews. Uh, this would be to the admin team. Uh, how often are performance reviews for a position like step room hand? Typically, we do one first year of employment and then every few years. And, and every three years. Every three years. And she was employed for eight years? Seven. Seven. And there was only one review. Right. I should have given her one in 2015. I should have given her one in 2015 in the spring. With that, we're closing statements. Nate, do you want to go first or last? Assuming you want to go last, good. Yes, that would be great. Thank you. All right, I'll hand it off to the district for a two minute closing statement. Thank you, President Lynch. I think the board needs to be careful not to wake out too much into the minutiae of the details. I think Ms. Vandenberg's uh, testimony to the board is really capsulize what's really going on, which is a history of problems that uh, were attempted to be addressed, not successfully, in fact, as she indicated, she thought things became worse instead of better. Uh, I think the evaluation and how many there were is a, is a little bit of a red herring, because if you remember what Ms. Vandenberg said, she was meeting with Ms. Van Housen on a weekly basis. And uh, I think constant and regular feedback is probably a much better tool for employees to understand their job performance and uh, positives and minuses. Remember, she did Ms. Van Hout did stress positives from Ms. Van Hout. And the problem is the negatives outweigh the positives. I think the real question is, is, is the decisions that were made to suspend her and not renew her employment supported by what we've heard tonight. Remember, Mr. Willems asked where things were in those 81 pages. If everything was in that 81 pages, we wouldn't be here tonight. You wouldn't need to have this hearing. Uh, 
Joan and Jim supplement what's in those 39 pages. The real bottom line is uh, the decision that was made based upon Ms. Van Housen's uh, weaknesses and inability to work collaboratively, not just with administrators, but with the student family advocates. You've seen what they've submitted, and uh, there are three versions of that. There's the public version, which came to the board, and there's the private version, which is the entire paragraph omitted from the one that came to the board. But if you read that, it's very telling about how the student family advocates feel about the situation. So I think the real decision here is that we're going to support its staff. And I think they made a, a good decision uh, when it's based on the evidence and we ask that you uh, support what the administration has done. Thanks, Jim. Nate? Okay. Could you just pass those along to board members? And this is that one evaluation. Okay. Did you? Well, it must be the first term.
So thanks to everybody involved in the difficult situation. Thanks for the audience for the most part being uh, quiet. It was very it was so close, but I understand it's emotional, all right? That's okay. That's okay. But we need to run our meeting. We need to make uh, you know decisions. We you know make big decisions all the time. The best interest for fourteen thousand students, and that's what we'll do here tonight. So. In terms of board deliberation, the next thing from a process standpoint is board deliberation and possible action. Uh, there's really three possible options. Um, first is no action. I wouldn't recommend that um, because uh, nobody's generally happy with no action. No action would uphold the administrative decision. Uh, but generally, when we've gone through this amount of effort and there's this amount of interest, people like that motion of vote. Um, or option two is to uphold the administrative decision. I would suggest that I think it's more technically correct that the first motion to uphold the administrative decision, but that's up to us. Or the third is to overturn. I mean, it's almost the same. It's the same vote either way, it's just the opposite direction. So there would be the opportunity to overturn the administrative decision. Um, it's up to us in terms of how much we want to deliberate before we get into a motion or, or this decision. Um, we can certainly go around the table and see where everybody's at. Well, um, this time was hoping I get a chance to just ask a couple follow up questions to the closing arguments and to, to narrow down whether they, just exactly what the issue is that, that they want us to well, Chris, what's the question? Well, the well, question is, uh, one of them is, you know, there's two reasons, there's two things the administration might be arguing, both of them, I hear both of them, but are they arguing that it is okay to fire her for doing X? Or are they arguing that that is not why they fired her? And I'd like to get a little bit more of a grip on whether they're arguing just one of those or whether they're in both of those. So as far as going to board members without going through the chain of command, are they saying under their interpretation of the policy that is a permissible reason for firing someone? Or are they saying, no, that's not why we fired her? Are there any other clarifying questions? Well, yes. Uh, the follow up on that would be when we interpret our policy, for example, the one about uh, being able to express an actual dissent or being able to approach the board. Don't we have to do that in a way that's consistent with existing law, such as Chapter 70 or, or such as the First Amendment? Um, and is that interpretation that you can insist that people go through the chain of command first, is that consistent? With the government law. Are there any of those administration you want to speak to? I would ask the other side too for, you know. Sure. Well, those are complicated questions, but I think that the real answer is that um, employees have rights, there's some limitations on those rights. The board itself has set processes for people to. I don't really like the term chain command, but to bring uh, matters up through the structure that the board and the district have created, which are to take things to your meeting supervisor and up through the process. And uh, that, I don't think, is necessarily, you say that's the reason that Ms. Van Housen was suspended or the reason she was terminated. It's symptomatic of the bigger issue, which is, uh, her doing it, she chooses uh, relying on district policies when it's to her benefit, relying on McKinney Ventro when it's to her benefit, but not acting in a, a teamwork fashion with her peers, uh, with the other student family actors. And that's, that's kind of a long answer, but those specific items are not the, the real reason. Uh, I would call them evidence or uh, symptoms of the underlying syndrome. It's all those things put together. And remember that, as Mr. Peterson said, the decision to not renew the employment uh, was made over a period of two months. It wasn't made on April 13th. And really, there are two things for the board to decide, I guess. One is the appropriateness of uh, suspension, and two, the appropriateness of uh, terminating her employment. And I think both of those are raised in the appendix six complaint. I, I don't know if I really answered your, your question directly, but. Well, I, I'm wondering if you're agreeing with um, um, Brian, Director Kirshen's um, interpretation that when it says you are free to approach the board, the exclusive way of doing that is through Appendix 6. I think that depends upon the circumstances. 
Uh, I'm not sure that Appendix 6 is the only method to approach the board because I think citizens and employees have a right to do that. Uh, it's a question of whether they have made all reasonable efforts to resolve the issues at another level before coming here. Um, and if, if, we, if there are some, and certainly some of the things identified, interpreted a certain way, would be permissible reasons for discharging somebody. Uh, but if there are also other reasons at work that are not permissible reasons for discharging someone, do you just have to prove that there was a permissible reason, one among many? Or do you have to prove mm -hmm. that the, the impermissible reason did not sort of tip the scales? I think what we've attempted to establish is that it was not the, that, let me put it this way, things are handled in what I would say was a somewhat clumsy fashion. And uh, the way it was put into the April 13th memo, uh, I think you have to look at the context and what the intent was, not necessarily the lower words. I don't think there was a suspension or termination that was violated either Chapter 20 or that whistleblower statute. Uh, those were, I guess, I call them uh, add-ons to the underlying reasons why uh, suspension occurred. And the, uh, the, the termination uh, had something to do with the uh, letters from the student family advocates and consultation and collaboration among the mem members of the administration. I don't think, in other words, I don't think the termination was, was a product of either contacting ISEA or contacting this match or an approach to the board. I think it was a decision made in a bigger context about can this employee be brought back in a functional way to the district. All right. Any, any response to that question? Two questions. We, as I said, we, we've attempted to respond to what was put in paper on April 13th. And, and as Joe pointed out, you know, termination decision happened a month or two later. And, and then at that point, you know, the, the district provided 81 pages of supporting documentation to the board. So we've also attempted to respond and reply to all of those 81 pages. And that has been our focus here. Anything that, that it, it was, was not part of that, it, you know, it's not been something we've been able to prepare for you, uh, uh, you know, in advance. Uh, but to try to answer your second question, in terms of the talking about chain of command, I uh, would tell you very, very strongly that the idea of you know, any administrator kind of having some type of a veto over a person reporting, uh, whether it be to, to, a, to a, the appropriate governmental agency or what have you, is it, just inconsistent with the nature of, the, of any typical whistleblower statute. Uh, and I you know, think that maybe uh, part, of, part, of the, part of the situation here. All right, so there is no one to the table. You want to a motion to vote? I said in July, I'm not interested in being an HR director, I'm not interested in being superintendent. I do think there's um, performance in here that uh, is the reason we're here. And um, I, I was interested to watch the internal reaction as this whole thing, because I heard the external, saw some administration's uh, point of view, but um, based on the internal uh, reaction from our staff, I support the administrative decision. It's a complicated situation because we can see all on both sides. Um, so we have a system in Asia right now. It's interesting. It's kind of my background. But, um, so I don't know where I kind of stand a little bit. 
because you know you hear both sides of it and it's complicated. But at the end of the day, I always have to think about how this impacts students. I'm thinking about, you know, we go one way, how does this impact the, the staff and their workings, and how does that limit our students and what they're able to get? And then I, I think about the, the other part of it where the community considers it, it a win. Um, but then I'm still thinking about how does this negatively or positively impact our children. And I'm, I'm not seeing our kids coming up enough in this situation about how they will be better served. And so that's complicated, but that's what I'm here for. I'm not here for all these other pieces of it. I'm here so that our kids will uh, get better outcomes. Um, and it's, it's troubling to me that this is the, that our kids are only, it's coming across as our kids are only served by one person, and that's problematic for me when it's supposed to be a larger staff just doing it. So, um, so obviously there's some issues on both ends about timely, you know, um, uh, evaluations and, and learning to work collaboratively with, with coworkers. So uh, I don't know where I am right in this segment. Um, I want to support both in some ways and, and not in others. So um, maybe by the time we go through, I'll get some more time to process. Cool. Uh, I think we're all at a point. I was going to say we're in a tough position um, trying to decide uh, via, uh, you know, HR um, decisions. That's not really what we're here for, but. Uh, I understand the concerns that Stephanie's brought up, um, lack of um, evaluation is one thing that sticks out to me. Trying to relate this back to my business background, uh, I know we have regular evaluations that we go through. Um, before we terminate someone, we you know go through a probation period and whatnot. Um, but in the end, I, I went with Tasha. You know, I, I didn't hear that students aren't being serviced. Um, or the students needs are still take, being taken care of. I think that's still happening. I haven't had any complaints in my short time on the board. But that's not happening um, since that has been dismissed, suspended and dismissed. Um, my biggest issue comes back to uh, having student family advocates feel they're not being supported uh, by someone that's leaving them, that there's some um, Disagreements between them, there's some hostile, maybe, maybe that's not the best word, uh, feelings there. Uh, well, I think I'll let everybody else kind of go around and maybe come back to me. Come back and say some more. I, I, I'm more in Chris's um, boat as far as that. Uh, I think that'll be I tend to agree more with the decision that was made. Um, but I'm willing to listen to everybody else's opinion as well. All right, Chris. Uh, you know, for me, I just want to really focus in on what I think the issue is. And to me, uh, I, I don't want to get involved with, uh, you know, second-guessing personal decisions either. But the issue for me is, did this termination violate one of our policies? If it didn't violate our policy, then I would say hands off. It's not for the board to get involved. Um, and so they identified uh, several policies that didn't get violated. And I think we have to think about whether it did violate those policies. Um, and, and part of that for me it means recognizing that you don't have to be a perfect employee to be protected by these various policies. Um, certainly not to be protected by Chapter 70A. Uh, as far as I can see, Chapter 20, certainly not to be protected by the First Amendment. Um, Appendix 6, again, I would interpret in ways that are consistent with that. Um, so I think, you know, we know that employees do have a right to speak out on matters of public concern. There are limitations on that right in the First Amendment. Um, there are, you know, probably, probably the rights under 70A we are a little bit stronger in some ways than under the First Amendment. Um, under all of those, 
it, it does not seem to me like there is any real argument that it is okay to fire someone for doing that if they've done that without going through the chain of command. And I would interpret chapter uh, appendix six that same way. And if we limit chapter six, uh, sorry, appendix six, or if we limit the, the policy that people are free to approach board members just to those who have done it through appendix six, to me, we're never gonna get any of the information that we need to have. You know, it's just gonna limit the flow of information. because people are gonna be afraid uh, to work it out through. So it comes down to me whether she would have been terminated at that time if she had not done, had not spoken up in ways that are supposed to be protected. Um, and so, you know, we're hearing arguments, well, no, what happened anyways? Basically, what I'm interpreting some of the arguments on, on the administration side to be. Um, but we also have, you know, if some of the documents made it hard for me to reach that conclusion, including the letter that really did seem to emphasize these, you know, speaking up uh, and going to the board. And then we have also, I'm looking at the letter, I'm trying to quickly here, you know, when, um, it's April 6th, it's from Jim Peterson, Stephanie, I'm extremely disappointed in your email to the board and your insinuation of possible retaliation after our conversation about following the appropriate chain of command. Expressing your uh, when expressing your opinion to deceased publicly from criticizing administrators in our district. Um, I consider this a blatant act of insubordination. And that's, you know, that makes it sound like it was a big factor in what then ensued. And to me, that's that's just too broad. I mean, you can't tell people they can't criticize administrators if they're speaking out on a matter of public concern. Um, so I would come down thinking, boy, it does look to me like this, this made a difference. And for that reason, I'd be inclined to say there ought to be a remedy, and the question is what's the remedy? Um, you know, again, I'm just sort of taking what I hear for, it sounds to me like there is some tension in this relationship, but I think that's not overstating it. But to me, you know, if you have to fix the, if, if fixing this problem means putting an employee back into a tense situation, um, you know, that's where the employee would have been if, if they hadn't engaged in the protected speech. I'd say that's what we have to do. Um, anything else, I think, this leads to a real strong message that you better not speak up publicly about anything or else. So that's kind of wrong. All right, all right. As I you say, I'm going to say that I think this is really difficult. Um, I think any of us uh, who are going to be in this position when we're at the board, um, I certainly feel like a lot of my um, There's been some new things learned tonight. Sometimes I find it takes me a little time to synthesize these things um, to come to a position and ask where I feel like I'm at. And I feel like I, I'm still synthesizing it. I, I guess I'm not really sure um, where I'm at completely. Um, one thing I will just add, um, and by the way, thank you, fellow directors, for giving your thoughts. It is helpful for me to hear what you all have to say um, as I think about this as well. Um, one thing that I will add to what has already been shared is, um, is my concern that I've raised before about future litigation and the cost that that would be to our students um, as it comes out of the general fund. And I can see that um, being um, very costly and very much more painful um, than what we've already seen here tonight. Um, so that's just something I'm throwing into the mix as well as I, I've asked that question, um, you know, the, the uh, likelihood or the um, impact, um, financial and such, of uh, future litigation, and um, I don't feel as though I have received an answer to that question. Um, we don't have the counsel here to sit here with us tonight, um, and so um, not being a person who does this every day, um, I guess I'm, I'm just trying to figure out myself 
Um, but I, uh, this is a case that would um, turn out favorably for, favor for us or not. And the dispute has to seem quite significant um, if, it, if it goes through a judge and um, um, As board members, you know, the first action we take is we swear an oath to the Constitution and to the codes and laws of the state of Iowa, not to the superintendent. And we are to be jealous advocates for our students and our stakeholders. Um, it was mentioned that uh, there was some derogatory or uh, some things said about special ed. Well, granted, the AA had some things to say too, and the state of Iowa. Uh, I don't think that this termination act, really, that the fact that it happened at the same time we got that report happened in a vacuum. I think the two are linked. It was stated in that report that uh, they are looking into a retaliatory culture in our district. This could be an example, I don't know. Uh, and I go with uh, what Chris is saying too, you know, if it's, if it looks strongly like because someone's contacting the board or other people, uh, that's their right and they should do it. Um, you know, where the school district can either be looked at as a bureaucracy, and I hope it's not a dictatorial bureaucracy, but uh, it, looking at this job description, it puts, as council stated, it puts the person in that position in somewhat of an adversarial position advocating for students. And I think you gotta expect that if someone's a jealous advocate for kids. And that's what, as far as I'm concerned, that's what we want. Now, does that mean that there wasn't some rough around the edges? Well, uh, we all have a little rough edges at times, uh, so we can work on those. Uh, but uh, I'm interested in people who are jealous advocates for our students, and I uh, share the concerns of uh, Director Roblin about the cost, and we can, there's a sheet right here with what we spent on the litigation, and, it's not inexpensive, and uh, is it cheaper to uh, rehire this individual and, and uh, work with developing them into the person that we want? Is that going to be cheaper in the long run, or, or litigating this, or that? Uh, I, I think it's going to be cheaper in the long run if we hire this individual back and, and, and work with it. And uh, uh, I guess, you know, when, if we're going after people because they have, have concerns or questions about how the, the boss is running the show or when anybody left to run the issue. So I'm going to just say, Brian, I'll make this fairly short. Um, very good, not always my strong suit. But um, back in July, I had uh, voted not to have this hearing. Um, and I believe it actually has been helpful to have this hearing and to see the documents as public record as part of our agenda and to hear uh, cross-examinations and presentations by both sides. Um, I think it's also been very helpful uh, and I, I thank uh, I believe the Director Hemingway for uh, requesting the job description be included in the packet, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, when I go through the job description, I see uh, uh, a number of qualifications and responsibilities that, uh, to me, it appears that uh, Ms. Van Housen uh, was fulfilling. It also appears that Ms. Van Housen may have been doing a number of things that were not necessarily part of the, the job description. Um, I believe, from what we've heard, or what I've heard, excuse me, I can't speak for what I know speak, from what I've heard that, and what I've read here, that there have been concerns for a while. A number of 
concerns and ongoing coaching and weekly meetings. Um, I don't believe that the tours, that the tour, excuse me, at Grant Wood is a singular item, but I do believe it is the straw that broke the camel's back. Um, we all have effects on who we interact with on a daily basis. Um, Stephanie's uh, primary effect should be helping homeless students. Um, what I've heard during her time with Paige Administrative Lead is that there has not been a loss of services to students. I believe that our students are still being served incredibly well. I also think that there are effects on the other individuals that we interact with on a daily basis in our workplaces. Um, the concerns stated by student family advocates in the, pack, in the packet is telling to me. The concern to have their names redacted for fear of retribution is concerning to me. The fact that uh, HR Director Peterson noted tonight that despite community individuals uh, coming out in support of Ms. Van Housen, there has not been a single person within the organization itself. Those effects are wide-reaching within the organization. I've, I've never really met Stephanie. I have. I've received a couple of emails since all this began. Um, the most telling of which to me was about the change in our agenda. Um, and if the level of accusation and vindictiveness is a small window of what other individuals working on a daily basis come in contact, contact with, then I do support the administration's decision. I think that when it comes to this, the other employees of the organization, and the student services that have not been lacking, I believe that the individual that's tasked with running the organization has made the best decision for the organization and for continuing to provide services to students. Hey, can I make a suggestion about how it might make sense to, to do motions? I mean, it's like you say, it doesn't matter if they're now either. But it, it makes a little difference because to me, if we were going to actually find in Mr. Manhausen's favor, it would make a lot more sense to do that in the form of a settlement of litigation. And so I wonder if it might make more sense to phrase the motion if, if someone else wants to make a motion to uphold the administrative decision, to put the motion that way. And then if it's voted down, you know, I would make a motion to schedule a, a litigation closed session to discuss settlement before we actually reach any conclusion on this so that we'd be able to you know, if, if there's if there's a critical mass for for you know reinstating her, maybe it make more sense to do that through settlement meeting. Well, the agenda items are six months. Right, but we could postpone the conclusion of that decision until after we then took one more shot. Yeah, you can take action. So I'm kind of I'm kind of thinking it might make sense to put the motion the other way so that we don't have to work right now decide that's better. I mean, that's a question. Is, is there is, is some argument? No, I mean, I, I think we can hear that. Is a, I'm just commenting on uh, what's on the agenda tonight is the back six. Mm -hmm. no, we can't give you. Oh, no, we can't have that litigation settlement meeting now. We'd have to do it with notices. Okay. The motion could be interesting, right? So, I'll make a motion unless there's further discussion. Wait for somebody to make a motion. Okay. okay. I propose a motion that the board direct the superintendent to reinstate Stephanie Van Housen to the previous position and compensate Stephanie Van Housen for leave without pay and loss of income during termination of the reinstatement. Is there a second? Well, I'll send it in for discussion purposes. For the discussion? Yeah. Okay. So for discussion purposes, we should add the one to the three, we should be no action, which should be a full administrative decision, or we're trying to administrate the decision any further, and it should be um, intelligent. I'm sorry, I, I didn't quite hear you. For the purposes of this hearing, it should be one of the three things, no action, administrative decision. 
administrative, uh, the Honorable Administrative Decision or overturning the Administrative Decision and the other relationship should be handled. So that's an argument against those motions. I'm just saying what I feel it should be doing. I don't believe that motion is turning into the order it's supposed to be. I thought he was just trying to spell out overturning the decision. I mean, if we just said we were going to do a decision, like failure to be compensation, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I don't know. I mean, what's the proper way for someone to make a motion that we, over, that we overturn the decision? I'm just saying that it's through the motion. It will not be supported. I think you both get your points of view, so there's other uh, discussion items. Can I just read one thing from a, from a case? Uh, it's a First Amendment case. And I don't, I don't mean to say it's. How's it relevant to this? Oh, it's, it's it has been, 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 been presented to the so it has been presented to the board. Well, in terms of... Um, so Process-wise, I'm really... Well, it, it goes to whether she engaged in any kind of protected conduct that she couldn't be fired for. You're not... So both sides have had the opportunity to present the case, so we have gotten into this. Well, so I'm not I can just talk it out with one. I mean, it's, uh, it's my own policy or anything I can say. To, is the burden of this motion? Because that question just go ahead. Yeah, I think it's burden. It won't take too long to clear up. I, I just want to be clear the board is not, needs to be pertinent to the events. So. I think it's the burden. Okay. Um, you know, the first time case uh, from 1968, and I'm not saying it's the sum total of all the laws out there, um, but it was a case where a teacher was fired uh, for speaking out against the school board's handling of a bond proposal and for the way it allocated its resources. She also criticized the superintendent for attempting to prevent teachers from opposing or criticizing the bond issue. And the court said that was protected speech and that it outweighed the government's interest in workplace management. And it made the point um, in question whether a school system requires additional funds is a matter of legitimate public concern on which the government of school administration cannot, in a society that leaves such questions to popular vote, be taken as conclusive. On such a question, free and open debate is vital to inform decision making by the electorate. Teachers as a class are, are the members of the community most likely to have informed and definite opinions as to how funds that fall out at the operation of schools should be spent. Accordingly, it's essential that they be able to speak out freely on such questions without fear of retaliatory dismissal. I feel like that uh, that kind of sums up why I think it would be a mistake to uh, not find much. For the session, so could you just repeat the last part of your motion? I'll just read the whole thing again. I propose the motion that the board direct the superintendent to reinstate said event housing for a previous position and compensate said event housing for the people that pay and lost the income during termination of the reinstatement. Further discussion? Online voting is open. I tried it a couple times, so I guess it's up to you if you guys want to log out and log back in and see if that works or if you want to do a roll call verbal. Roll call. Lee Big. Yes. Deloach. No. Hemingway. Yes. Rotlin. Yes. 
Kirschling? No. Lynch? No. Wrestler? No. Motion fails with directors Liebig, Hemingway, and Rotland voting yay, and directors Deloach, Kirschling, Lynch, and Wrestler voting nay. Lee Big. No. Deloach. Yes. Hemingway. No. Rotlin. No. No. Thank you. Kirschling. Yes. Lynch. Yes. Wrestler. Yes. Motion carries with directors Deloach, Kirschling, Lynch, and Rosler bidding voting yay and directors Liebig, Hemingway, and Rotland voting nay. All right, and thanks for everybody's uh, interest in this topic. With that, I'm going to get a motion to adjourn. Well, of course, it does say in Appendix 6 that we have to issue a public statement regarding our decision. Is that something we do? Or... Okay. Well, thank you. 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 If we could just hold on one second and take a motion for adjourn. So, personally, I'm going to go to the second. All in favor say aye. 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 Aye